Welcome back, everyone. Over to you, Werner. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for, very much for attending this talk. So what I'm going to talk tonight about is just a little bit about what I experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic as an educator. Uh, and one of the big things that I learned was, you know, just the humanity of it all. Uh, now to give you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, so I am a pharmacology associate professor at the University of Pretoria um, in South Africa. And um, I started off in basic sciences research. And eventually when I got permanent employment, I also fell in love with education. And um, I consider myself at this stage, an emerging health professions education researcher. Um, so I come to you with experience in education, but not yet an expert. I am steadily moving towards that sector. Um, but because I'm such an enthusiastic person for everything that I love, um, even at a quite a junior age, I started accumulating quite a few responsibilities. And um, before long, even before my permanent employment, I uh, had a comparative workload to some of the permanent staff members. So that being said, I mean, I got wonderful opportunities, which really spearheaded my growth uh, going forward. And I can never look back on that. Uh, but what it unfortunately also means is that um, by the time 2019 rolled around, I had a, a quite a hectic work schedule. I was working way beyond the hours needed. Um, doing a little bit of everything. Um, I have quite a high student burden, quite a high lecture load, and a lot of administrative functions. Um, and although this was very good for my growth, um, it obviously did take a toll on my work-life balance, uh, my sanity, and so forth. Uh, so just before COVID-19, uh, the head of the Department of Pharmacology at that stage uh, received a promotion. So uh, we were left without a manager for the department, and I was afforded the opportunity to be the acting head for a couple of months, which eventually turned out to be more like a year. Um, now, th this was a great opportunity for me, and uh, because of the, the atmosphere that had steadily degraded over the years, um, one of my specific goals here was to try and get the atmosphere back to normal, get everybody with a proper work-life balance, everybody motivated, and so forth. So I was quite pumped for it, although um, I must say I, I was feeling the pressure because unfortunately I gained a lot of responsibilities but didn't lose any uh, in this time either. So you can imagine that within the, the years, um, it, it had steadily just started to wear me out. Uh, I had lost a lot of my life to work, um, although I enjoyed it immensely. I must say my social life took a knock. Uh, steadily, my mental health was declining, um, as I guess is rife in academia. And um, before I knew it, I was heading very, very much for burnout. Um, and unfortunately, one of those things is that you, you don't know how deep the hole is until you realize you can't climb out anymore. Um, so when COVID hit, I had already, I guess, a, a bit of a damn ready to burst mentality. Now, South Africa naturally was not spared the, <laughs> the ravages of the pandemic. Um, so when we, we got the first notice of a case in South Africa, I think we were all just sitting around waiting for, you know, what is going to happen? Uh, unfortunately, nobody really knew, but the expectations were that, you know, a lockdown is coming. We were going to have to move to remote working. So we were just waiting to see what government would say. But me being experience in education and quite enthusiastic meant that I was also quite confident and excited to be very honest. Um, looking back at it, I, I saw this as a challenge and a challenge I can overcome. Um, and I thought this would be the perfect trigger for our department and university to really ramp up the quality of education, try something new and really make a name for ourselves around the world as being an excellent institution for this. Um, so maybe I was looking back at it now uh, a bit arrogant in that response that, you know, I would be fine. I could predict what would happen. Um, but me being me, I steadily started to overthink life as one does. Uh, and I mean, social media didn't help at all with everything you see around that. Um, so all of this paranoia started to creep in because 
daily I was doing damage control at a managerial level. I was being invited to meetings left, right, and center, which at oftentimes was just an administrative rigmarole, uh, keeping me away from my work. So unfortunately, with all of the, the issues at place, um, I was starting to, to lose track of what was important. And with this, unfortunately, came all of the, the trepidation. Um, I mean, now we have to move to online teaching, learning, and assessment, but, you know, should it be synchronous or asynchronous? What about the validity of assessments? Um, we live in a low to middle income country, so a lot of our students, unfortunately, still struggle with internet connectivity or just basic device um, attainment. So would they actually be able to attend any of the classes or even use the resources we make available to them? Uh, once we get to a testing environment, what do we do then? Um, our university doesn't have a, a really sharp proctoring system, uh, so we would have to use whatever was to our availability, which means it comes with advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I could not ask for anybody around me really to support my, my active uh, work because everybody was overworked and I felt way too guilty to even put anything on their plates. Um, so with all that being said, I, I needed to think about how was I going to streamline what I was doing to get it done with the limited time that I have to quality and to efficacy. And that's when I asked myself a couple of difficult questions. Um, and it required a bit of a paradigm shift in my educational philosophy about what I, as a pharmacology educator, was trying to teach everybody. Um, would we be able to even monitor attendance to any viable degree? Because naturally, when it boils down to it, um, you can't force students to be in the online class if they don't have a device that can support it. Uh, setting up rules might be completely worthless at the end of the day if the rules are there for specific people and not for everyone. Um, so doing something like invigilated tests or proctoring, um, you know, what was the validity or the uh, realistic effect thereof? Um, and I mean, when we look at this, the obvious question that came into play was what about the integrity of the whole academic environment? Um, naturally, when we look at uh, assessment, this is kind of an outcome, but were we going to lose this at micro to macro levels, anywhere from the students to what we're doing? Uh, and I mean, social media did not help. You see all of the, the COVID students um, that are being mocked about their incompetence eventually. So naturally, it doesn't create an environment that really is amenable for mental health. Um, now, to, to quell my fears, uh, I made a couple of decisions. Um, I was going to use our learning management system to the best of my ability to try and circumvent anything from teaching, learning to assessment. The assessments I was aiming to get even better than it was at that stage, making it more effective, more uh, contextualized and kind of cheat proof if I kind of hope for it. Um, and I acknowledge the issue. I mean, we're sitting in an incredibly difficult environment, but um, it doesn't help to complain about it because we're here and something needs to be done. Uh, and the biggest question to me naturally was, you know, what about the test? How are we going to prevent it from being um, manipulated. And what I eventually came to understand is that um, creating an ethical environment for my students was the best course of action. So making them understand that cheating was in no way going to benefit them down the line. And if I'm going to trust you not to cheat, I'm going to adhere to that. And um, hopefully that also stimulates that effect that they were going to trust the environment and not want to cheat. Uh, so what I'm just quickly going to run through is some of the things that I did throughout the year um, that really had an effect on me as a teacher uh, at the end of the day. So women are honors course, which is a very small group. We were dealing very much with a, a physical space um, working environment. So students would come to class and we would do whatever we wanted to do. But naturally now in the online teaching space, we try to shift things around. And uh, what I tried to do was very much capitalize on collaborative learning um, and engaging them in authentic environments for what they, they were learning about. Now, one of the new lectures that I got for that year was uh, a lecture called Writing an Article, which at that stage had been a didactic lecture. So I decided to flip the script and make it all about appraising articles 
so that they can understand how to write from that. Uh, so they were going to read a couple of articles, anything from the worst possible to the greatest, and then write a couple of notes on it based on a framework uh, and ultimately relate it back to what they had written at that stage and do a comparison. And this would then naturally be discussed between the group. And what the students really kind of emphasized here was that they, they could see the mistakes they were making based on the things they didn't like in articles. And it was quite funny to see how pedantic and critical they were of other people in science, uh, while not necessarily immediately seeing that in their own work. And throughout the journaling exercise ad that year, you could see they were very much looking at how can I improve, but constantly acknowledging that they were making the same mistakes over and over again. We have another activity which was based on pharmacokinetics, which is uh, a variety of biological processes that a drug needs to go through to, to get into the body. Uh, what I had them do was create in a team-based setting scenarios linked to some of these concepts and then to ultimately discuss it with one another. And um, we would then adaptively um, go forward with any concepts that uh, were being assessed. And then finally, there was a consolidation activity to fill in the blanks. Now, the lucky thing here is that because it's such a small group, we could do subjective questioning. So they had a couple of randomized, uh, randomized uh, essay type questions in their learning management system. And the nice thing is as well, because it was small, we could give them personalized feedback. We could specifically see where they were going wrong, where they were going right, where they were elaborating way too much or way too little. And we could see that conceptual difficulties that came into play. And I, I do believe that in the absence of that physical learning space that they had in the laboratory, it really did help them. Now, the undergraduate pharmacology module here is kind of the, the big one. This is the one that knocked my heart for a six and um, unfortunately, or fortunately, had the biggest effect. Uh, now, serendipitously, this module was already online ready. Uh, I really believe a lot in hybrid and blended learning, so I tried to already created in such a format. Um, however, there were naturally a couple of things that were very much in the physical space. So when COVID hit, this just needed to shift to online. Um, all the assessments were in any case online at that stage, apart from uh, our written module tests, uh, which they naturally just also needed to move online. And this is the one that caused the most trepidation for me. Uh, now, once again, my biggest concern was I didn't have a lot of time, uh, so I couldn't peruse the web for multiple instruments and tools to use. So I reverted to, to narrative presentations, but I really tried to ramp it up, making it more visually appealing, interactive, trying to get them into a sense of what actually happens with pharmacology. And what I could build into these narrative presentations were interactive formative assessment opportunities where just by clicking on a button um, in a case style um, question, you could get a bit of formative feedback on whether or not you were correct or wrong. Um, and with that, a little bit of humor, just to try and at least make it a bit more of a fun environment. Now, this is nothing major and nothing to, to really get excited about, but it was something simple that I could do in that time that, that benefited the course. Um, I wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel. I wasn't trying to create the next medical educator um, paper. I was just trying to survive. Uh, we also made use of the learning management systems online platform quite a lot. Uh, and the nice thing here is that using those visual tools, once again, we could really interact properly with the students. However, the major concern was that across the board engagement was quite poor. Um, and we, we know engagement is linked to learning. So I had constant fears about this. Um, with the module tests uh, that we transferred onto an online space, um, from surveys that I'd done beforehand, I was already quite aware that if we were doing synchronous online testing, it would be a mess. Um, it would either need to be incredibly short or it would need to be as simplistic as possible to get through it because students were struggling with bandwidth, uh, with reliable connectivity, with power outages and so forth. So we eventually settled on creating an open book assessment um, that was asynchronous in nature. So they would download the paper, complete it offline, upload it for plagiarism checking and eventual marking. Uh, and where possible, we had multiple papers, um, but that eventually became unfeasible. 
Now, what I found very, very quickly was communication was key. Um, I, I became that annoying lecturer you would see very quickly in your inbox. Um, and, but I mean, at the end of the day, the students really appreciated it. And one of the feedback that I got in it was that um, there was never a point in time when they were unclear of the expectations of the module or um, what was going to happen. And what I really tried to emphasize here was just the kind of the unclear atmosphere we had at that stage. I acknowledged things that I knew, um, for example, what we would be doing, but I also acknowledged what I didn't know, for example, when we would start classes again, because the recess was constantly shifting ahead the whole time. Um, and I found that this constant communication with them really did help set a good rapport. And I mean, when you don't meet your students in a physical space, just generating some sort of relationship already helps. And what I found was that regardless of how clear the instructions are, it can never be clear enough. Um, I mean, we deal with students who are not naturally English uh, speaking first. So um, sometimes it meant very pedantic emails, really spelling it out to a T. And there would always be something slipping through the cracks, but um, more information typically ended up being a lot better in my opinion. Now, because of the, the issue with bandwidth and connectivity and so forth, I could not expect all of my students to be there at all times. Um, when we eventually started going back out of lockdown, a lot of my students in the clinical space needed to go for clinical ward rounds. And because of social distancing, everything was staggered. Um, so the, the discussion board was seen as a reliable platform to get engagement, um, even if they couldn't attend in a synchronous fashion. And here we tried in various ways, um, looking at activities that were conceptual in nature, activities that try to apply those concepts a little bit more. And I'm a firm believer when we deal with pharmacology and experiential learning. So asking them about what they've experienced with specific medication or diseases. Um, so I was trying to get a sense of them in various spectrums. Um, but naturally social media doesn't <laughs> crawl uh, well, the fears, unfortunately, and all I was seeing at a daily pace was on our Instagram page for the university, just constant streams of students saying how they're not studying or they're waking up at eight o'clock in the evenings, complaining about lecturers being unfair for doing their jobs um, and, you know, openly bragging about going to cheat in a test. And this subconsciously crept in quite a lot and I realized it a little bit late, unfortunately. But I constantly had this idea in my head about this is what's happening. Um, now, when I perused the discussion boards based on these fears, what I saw was, you know, pretty much that. Out of a class of 310 students, between 6 to 14 students um, had actually participated in the activities, which is shockingly low. Doing a bit of a deep dive just showed that even more. It was always the same individuals, and even then, not always that dramatically well. And if we went to kind of the passive hits from it, we saw that, you know, people were passively looking at this, but passivity doesn't lead to learning. Um, they were maybe reading other people's answers, but they weren't really engaging with it. So they couldn't get personalized feedback or actually engage with the content. So most likely they were just reiterating a rote learning style. Um, but for the most part, uh, we received quite positive feedback at that stage. Um, students enjoy the interaction. They felt we were doing everything we needed to do. There was a lot of um, fear about online testing, but they kind of understood that this was all we had to deal with. So everything looked positive. Um, so the, the date of the first module test rolled around, uh, started, and I mean, I was sitting there, coffee in hand, ready to damage control whatever I could, and um, nothing, everything was fine, and I was truly shocked. I thought I would be bombarded with emails at the start, but everything went well, till about 20 minutes to the end, and then the, the proverbial poor poor hit the fan. Um, I was sitting there just fielding emails left and right. People's internet was breaking, uh, their computers were failing, they had accidentally deleted their tests and now couldn't find it anymore. And suddenly, you know, after about the 10th email or so, I realized if the system crashes, then, you know, it's going to fail. So I just 
started saying, email me your scripts. I will do plagiarism, plagiarism checking um, through the system myself. And eventually, you know, this took <laughs> quite a while to, to get through. Um, I immediately posted a survey as soon as I could after acknowledging receipt of all the emails, uh, just to get a sense of what went wrong. And what it pretty much turned out to be is technical difficulties. Um, for the most part, it was, you know, internet acting up or power outages or the device going crazy. Uh, ironically enough, when students got angry when the internet failed and punched their screen and unfortunately then broke their laptop, which not my problem, but eventually it becomes my problem. Um, and then the kind of big thing was the typing took way too long for them. Um, and they had some confusion about the uploading system. And, but they said that the test was fair. It was just the circumstances that created this issue. Um, so I felt good in the sense that I, I didn't do something wrong, but in the same sense, I kept on bashing myself saying that I clearly did something wrong. And in hindsight, I mean, I thought enough additional time was given for a typing delay, but clearly, I mean, it didn't. The worst thing was a lot of this could have been prevented by students communicated some, some of these challenges beforehand. Uh, for example, one student emailed me a couple of days after the test to say that half of his keyboard wasn't working, which once again, I can't do anything about it, but it is my problem at the end of the day. Um, and what made it even more depressing is when you start to look at all these papers and do plagiarism checking and you see there's just a lot of cheating going on here and there. Um, and students just say it, it's coincidence. It's, you know, it, they almost take it as an offense if you tell them that they've been cheating. Um, now communication was quite intense at that stage to try and calm everybody down. We explained how we were going to adjust everything. We kind of reiterated two-way communication, uh, disciplinary action and so forth. Um, and it helped to once again set kind of the, the information pool ahead. Um, we had to adapt quite a bit. Um, so upon speaking to education consultants, uh, we had devised a plan of altering the weighting of the tests, uh, taking uh, multiples of questions um, that they had scored very well in to kind of acknowledge the fact that many of them just ran out of time. Um, so we tried to cut it across the board evenly. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, you can only stretch it that far and there will always be issues. Um, and once again, we reiterated that two-way communication. But you can imagine by this stage, as somebody that is relatively experienced in education, I was not feeling grand about myself. Um, at this stage, I was feeling like a failure through and through. I was just feeling like I had lost all of the faith that I had built in my students in a very dramatic way. Um, so the day the marks got released, I was sitting there. I probably stared at the screen for about five minutes, unblinking. Um, I didn't really even know what to do. My husband just kind of patted me on the back every now and again, trying to console me. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, I mean, it had to be done. So after a while, I started seeing uh, emails come in and I was just dreading it. I, I was quite emotional at that stage. Um, and what I immediately remarked and what actually set off my emotions dramatically was the fact that nobody was shouting at me. Uh, the students were actually saying that they didn't study hard enough, um, that they thanked me for everything I was doing, that um, they were trying to, to improve and nobody was pointing fingers at me. Um, and it just shocked me. I mean, I, I really felt like I had avoided drama uh, nothing on social media either. Um, so what happened thereafter? How did I change? Um, so I saw, you know, the power of building relationships, the power of building kind of easy ways to engage students throughout. And I think what I had realized at that stage is that subconsciously I had started losing faith in myself and in my students. I had wanted them to trust me, but I had started to lose trust in them, uh, which was unfair. I felt that they would rake me over the coals and they didn't even try to do that. I did not get one negative feedback, one social media posting. I got rave reviews that year. Um, and it was based on one mistake that I had made. And I mean, hindsight is 2020. But I realized there that 
losing the relationship with the students is the worst thing that can happen to you. Because if you have that relationship, you can work wonders. You can avoid crises, or if a crisis arises, you can manage it more appropriately with the students actually trusting you to get through it. Um, the year had a massive effect on my mental health and I eventually went through burnout and it took a, a long time to recover from that. Um, but I just realized how that moment, that falling apart in my bedroom after you know hours of fielding emails um, eventually made me a much stronger and resilient person at the end of the day and has made me actually also recognize that you know, in academia, we're all just humans. Nobody trains you on any of these principles in full. A lot of this is learning on the job and learning in the pandemic. Um, and I think that's something we, we don't often acknowledge enough. Uh, the students see us as these pivotal leaders in our fields and we need to be able to do everything, but we're just human and we're gonna fail. Um, and if you're open about that to others, I think you start to realize many people share that sentiment. So that is my life story. Um, so hopefully it, it maybe helps somebody out there that's dealing with kind of similar feelings as well. Uh, thank you, everyone. So I'd like to open the floor for any questions that anybody might have. No questions. Maybe if we can just add one last thing. Um, I think we've seen in the literature quite often now that uh, when it boils down to it, the students are going through a whole lot of stress. Um, and I think it also shows that we are going through stress, but we should never forget that we're all in this together. And going forward, I mean, in each country, it's going to be specific, but I know in South Africa, we're now bridging into that territory of contact classes again. Um, and I can see students are fearful of it, They're excited for it, but fearful. And I can honestly also say that a lot of our staff members are dreading it. Um, some of them are not sure how to approach physical classes anymore. Some of them don't really want to do it because they've gotten used to a schedule which they can kind of do something online in the background and uh, do work in between. So it's a, an odd place that we have at this stage. And I think if we, we work together, we'll get a better sense of what's actually achievable down the line in the new normal. Uh, but if nobody has any questions or comments or anything, uh, thank you very much for attending the talk.